ready? We're ready. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Wasaga Beach. Good morning, Your Worship. Good morning, Deputy Mayor Bray. Good morning, Councilors. Good morning, staff. And before I call this meeting to order, I believe our CAO, George Van Wancour, uh, would like to, a moment to say a few words. Uh, George, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, members of council, staff, and the uh, viewing public. I wanna take a few moments and speak today about the passing of Jill Foster. For those watching at home or work, Jill was the wife of Councillor David Foster and someone many of us at Town Hall were fortunate to know over the years. Jill passed away on July 8th after a bat battle with cancer. Known for her engaging and caring way, Jill touched the lives of many in our community through the variety of hats she wore over the years and I know we will all miss her presence. The kind words shared by many in our community about Jill in recent days are a testament to the high regard she was held. On a personal note, I always enjoyed chatting with Jill over the years at different functions and events. No matter what the situation, she exemplified great empathy, warmth, and intelligence. On behalf of members of council and our entire organization, I extend our deepest condolences to Councillor Foster his daughters, Allie and Kirsten, other family members grieving this loss of Jill as, well of Jill, as well as Jill's many friends. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, from a personal note, I've known Dave and Jill for over 20 years and it's a tragedy and, and it's something that's going to take a long time for the family and that to get through and friends. But thank you for those kind words, George. Uh, if there's no other comments, I'm going to call this meeting of the Community Service Section of the Wasaga Beach Coordinated Committee Thursday, July 15, 2001 to order. Um, disclosure of pecuniary interest. We do have one right now. Uh, it's uh, Deputy Mayor Bray, item 5.5.8. And I just want to advise everybody, as usual, uh, if during the meeting we find that we do have a pecuniary interest issue, please let the, um, uh, the chair of the day know. Uh, that on, we're moving on to uh, 3.1 deputation presentations and we are pleasured to have a presentation today for Mr. Jeff um, McKeegan and Ms. Um, Kara Hovis of DIS Golf Community Courses. Jeff and Kara, welcome. And um, Dina, can we um, help them get their stuff going, please? Absolutely, thank you. Mr. Kinney, um, if I can have Jeff and Kara, you can please show your video, unless you're having issues, let me see. Hi, hi Dina, we're, uh, I think hi. you can hear me, but uh, I'm not able to start my video. Uh, okay. You can start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, let me see if I can fix that for you. Kara, you. I've, I've asked you to start your video, and Jeff, I'll get to you if I can find you in this list. My apologies. There you are. And hopefully that should work. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, do you want me to share the presentation, or will you pull the, sh the presentation up? Uh, we do usually ask the presenters to share their presentation. Yeah. Are you okay no with problem. doing that? That'd yeah, be I'll great. Just, I'll just set it up right now. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, good stuff. I'm gonna set my timer, uh, you tell me when, I know I have 10 minutes and I certainly don't wanna go over. Um, so you let me know whenever I'm ready to get going. Perfect, go ahead. Okay, timer set. Uh, so first up, I wanna thank you all for um, letting Kara and I come in and, and spend some time telling you a little bit about disc golf and a little bit about our experience with disc golf 
It's a rather lengthy presentation. Um, and the reason for that is just kind of a lot of stuff to cover off. It's kind of in two groupings, really. The first one is a little bit of an explanation of what is disc golf and why does disc golf matter? And the next part is a little bit about Kara and I and our role in disc golf in Canada. So um, I believe that questions are posed at the end. So I will just keep going and be mindful of the time. So thank you. So the first thing I want to share with you is the growth of disc golf. So disc golf has uh, been growing for a really long time. We have a great relationship with the PDGA, which is similar to the PGA, but with disc involved. So you can see that for the past decade, there's been kind of double digit growth of players of disc golf. So I wanted everyone to realize it wasn't, you know, a new sport or something that we invented because we certainly didn't. Where is it growing? Well, it's growing across the country um, and it's been growing across the country for quite some time. It's not isolated to one region or another region. Um, so you can see these are all sourced from CBC. So it's a, a reputable news source. You can see it's kind of everywhere. Ontario is really the main uh, driver of disc golf. You might be wondering what in the world is Jeff golf instead of a club you have a frisbee instead of a bag of clubs you have a bag of discs instead of a hole you have a suspended catching device uh, bottom left uh, is uh, hitting on the fairway is more throwing on the fairway and then you have putting and then there's a picture of people putting benefits of disc golf this is uh, you can spend 10 minutes on this slide alone um, you can play disc golf in the winter you can play it in the summer you can play it at night uh, it's a very low cost game um, and uh, we've seen people playing it from all walks of life, um, uh, all levels of uh, society. Um, pretty much everyone does play, even um, uh, people with uh, limited mobility are able to play, which is great. It's also uh, recognized as something that's more or less COVID, uh, I wouldn't say approved because nothing's COVID approved, but because of the nature of the game, um, you don't share discs. It's not a team sport. It's very much an individual contributor uh, factor. Um, it's uh, something you, you could play during COVID. A little bit about Kara and I, um, <clears throat> we're, I would say we're rather humble people, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about us. Uh, we started a disc golf business um, before um, COVID uh, arrived, um, so we've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, there's just some press about us. Uh, we've been featured on Block TO, Breakfast Television, uh, the Globe and Mail wrote an article uh, featuring us in June. Um, Kara, uh, our partner, my partner in uh, disc golf is uh, recognized as the first female disc golf park designer in the world, which is something we're very proud of. Um, and we just had a global news feature about us launched last Sunday. So we're really proud of the work we do. And one of the reasons we're so proud of the work we do is um, because of how many people have been able to enjoy the courses that we've built. Um, I'll share a little bit about that specifically. So um, we're from Toronto, please don't hold that against us. Um, but the story that we share is based on a story of disc golf in Toronto. So the first two disc golf courses that were established in the city of Toronto were in 1980. Um, so that's uh, Toronto Island and uh, Centennial Park. And then it took 31 years for the next course to come in, uh, which was in 2011. Uh, I discovered disc golf in 2014 and was really drawn to it for a lot of reasons. One of the main reasons was the community element of disc golf. It's a very inviting sport. It's very inclusive. So I spent some time uh, trying to get the city to add more courses, uh, self-funding the whole thing. Um, I really believed in this and I thought it could be a great community initiative. So after three, wor uh, three years of work, uh, the city approved a course uh, in the beaches, which is where I live. And this is a picture of me and a bunch of hardy volunteers in November installing the course uh, after obviously all approvals have been done by the city of Toronto. And then uh, this is our work that we do. Uh, a lot of the focus that we have with disc golf is about the community elements of disc golf, uh, specifically around families. Um, the courses that we have been building have been really geared towards um, not necessarily disc golfers, but communities in the region courses go. Um, so you can see there, for instance, uh, we're featured in Beaches Metro, and that's um, it's a young boy who's playing disc golf uh, at one of the Beaches holes. And you can see um, just a really good feel for this experience. Uh, the city liked it so much, they asked us to do another one. So we built the second course uh, of uh, the fifth course in the city at a park called Maryland Bell. And this is the same thing. So that's just a picture of us. It was just Kara and I who built it. 
was building it. And um, same thing, really strong community feedback, really uh, a really positive experience from a number of people uh, within the city um, on social media, but just even at the course itself. So what does the course look like? Well, you can see there's a suspended catching device or the basket on the left. That's Karina Canales. Karina Canales was four years old when this picture was taken. Karina and her father go disc golfing every day after work slash school. Um, I'm pretty sure that one day I will be asking Karina Canales to sign a disc for me. She loves disc golf and it's a, it's a really great story. You can see a T sign there. So, uh, you know, just kind of gives you an idea of the similarities to traditional golf. Um, and we include the PDGA code in all of our courses. And the reason for that is the PDGA code uh, denotes safety, responsible play, and all of the elements of the disc golf community that make it so great. And then you have a welcome sign there, which just explains the, the way the game is played uh, with the instructions on how to play it. Won't spend a lot of time here, but uh, the feedback from the City of Toronto was really positive, obviously working with us. Um, I guess the proof is in the pudding that in November of 2020, we built the third course in the city of Toronto. And this was a much bigger course, a much broader course. We, uh, we built this on one of the municipal um, uh, traditional golf courses. So you can see this course has uh, one hole, it's 919 feet, it's a par five. Uh, so it's much more uh, a broader scaled course. And similar thing, feedback from the community was wonderful. People enjoying themselves, people having something to do outdoors in a rather bumpy world. Uh, we all know what the winter was like, um, everyone dealing with many challenges in their life, uh, none, uh, not just COVID, but a lot of other things. So a little bit of a snapshot in terms of the feedback um, from the opening weekend, there was eight emails that went to the mayor uh, that we were CC'd on uh, thanking him. So that's uh, Mayor Tory. Uh, mayor Tory actually launched the course on his YouTube channel, which was something we're really proud of. Um, the ratings that we had on eDisc were really positive and were featured on BlogTO. This is a snapshot, it gives you an idea of the growth of the sport. So um, there's an app, it's a free app, it's not an app that we own, um, but it's an app that people can use when they arrive at the course. So they get there and they pull up the app and it allows them to access a scorecard so they can keep their stats. Um, the benefit of that is um, the app provides us with the user data. So we're able to share that with the municipalities to show, hey, are people even using that? And you can see, um, based on these numbers, that year-over-year -year growth of people using the disc golf courses in the city of Toronto have really um, expanded. Um, so it's uh, it's been a really popular thing. So this is uh, these are just some of the partnerships that we've been working with. So as it relates to courses, events, community, and beyond, um, we just launched the national uh, championships of disc golf in Ontario last weekend. Um, we're working uh, with Thunder Bay at the end of this month on the Northern Ontario Championship. These are just all events where people come together and play disc golf. It's a very positive experience. Um, everyone's obviously allowed to participate. Um, you don't have to be a pro player. There's various ratings and levels, so everyone's included. called Disc Golf Park. We don't work for Disc Golf Park, but we're able to harness all of their experiences. And one of the benefits of them is uh, in the year 2000 uh, in Finland, which is where they're based out of, there was only 17 disc golf courses. And at the end of this year, there was 787. So we're able to take kind of the best practices uh, from uh, Disc Golf Park in Finland and adapt those in Canada, specifically around introducing disc golf to communities that might not have it. And how do you do that in a way that includes um, the local community members? So it's not about adding a disc golf course where it's just about people from other uh, regions coming in. Some of the benefits of disc golf for local communities, um, there's lots, there's lots and lots. One of, the, one of the ways that's actually been very interesting is uh, local uh, stores being able to stock discs. There's a convenience store located close to one of the disc golf courses in the city of Toronto, and they now sell Frisbees, and it's a great way for them to generate a little bit of revenue. There's a home hardware in Lindsay that carries discs, for instance. A little bit of a breakdown of just kind of the things we take into consideration when designing courses, safety, locality, et cetera, et cetera. And then just a thank you with 10 seconds left. This is the PDJ code. So it's about playing smart, respecting the course and respecting the sport. And then just a, a confidentiality agreement. So, I mean, it is what it is. And that brings me to exactly 10 minutes. So thank you. 
Thank you, Jeff and Cora. And uh, I can't say I've ever played disc golf before. Uh, I am familiar with Frisbee, but at this time, I want to thank you for your presentation and turn it over to Council if there's any questions, please. Councilor Kinney, I believe the mayor had a question. Perfect. Uh, sadly, I'm not operating my screen right. I'm not seeing everybody. I'm going to try and do that. Your Worship, please go ahead. While you're doing that, I'm trying to fix my problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the presentation. Um, since staff have um, recommended this going uh, forward, we have received um, some concerns from uh, people in the area. Um, as far as parking and things like that, staff will respond to that later uh, in today's meeting. But when it comes to um, maintenance of the um, baskets and things like that, it looks like these aren't things that would turn ugly quickly. So I would think that um, there's not a lot of maintenance or anything like that. What about noise level of this game and what, it, uh, what would it produce as far as noise? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the noise level, uh, well, you might hear people laughing or um, you know, um, maybe um, talking to each other. Um, there, one the one noise that you would potentially hear is the noise of someone throwing a disc into a basket. Um, so there are the, the chains that come down. So that's the noise of the chains and the um, the disc landing in the basket. Um, it's not overly loud. Um, I guess it would be hard to. I don't have a almost a reference like a decibel level. Um, one thing I've learned is when people are starting to play, they spend more time throwing a disc than having it land in the basket, just as they get better. So it's more of the sound of a disc going through the air. Um, so it's a good question though. Okay, thank you for that. I just, I think it's important uh, for those who live in the area to understand that this isn't something um, other than me with, when I get it in the basket, there will be screaming because my, <laughs> my aim is not that great. So I'll be quite happy, but um, but yeah, so it's not a, a loud sport um, like some other sports that we may have. So it's pretty, it's a, pretty quiet. By, by very definition of the game, the concentration element, um, if people out there being loud, other people say, hey, listen, like I've just thrown my Frisbee six times. I need you to be quiet so I can focus on my game right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Worship, and I fixed my problem. I can see everybody now, and uh, just wondering if there would be any more questions of uh, Jeff or Cora. Not seeing anyone, um, Jeff, Cora, I want to truly thank you so much for your presentation. I think it's extremely informative. Uh, I love the concept. Uh, you're right. It gets people out and active in a safe way. And again, I thank you so much for taking the time to share it with us. Take care now. Thank you. Council, um, at this time I'd like to read the motion and get a mover and a seconder, please. That the community service section of coordinated committee received the presentation from Mr. McKeegan and Ms. Horvis or Hovas pertaining to disc golf community courses for information. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Wells and um, Her Worship. Uh, all in favor? Did I get my card? Thank you. That passes unanimous six to zero. Um, now I'm going to move down to other agencies and move on to our fire department. And again, as I said last time, one of the best chiefs in Ontario. Uh, Chief, take it ahead, please. Chief, there's an introduction. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, the month of June was actually our busiest month so far this year, uh, with 160 calls for service. The end of June, of course, marked the halfway point in the year, and at that time, our call volume was at 826 incidents for the for those first six months. With respect to notable occurrences. A fire caused by a lightning strike occurred in a home on June 29th. On arrival, firefighters found the house to be smoke filled. And after searching the resident, residence, found a fire in the crawl space due to a ruptured gas line. Uh, the fire was quickly extinguished and the damage was minor. 
We also responded to a smoke-filled home with smoke alarms sounding on, on July 5th. The homeowner had left the residence forgetting that she had something on the stove. The next door neighbor fortunately heard the smoke alarms, noticed the smoke through the windows and called 911. So this undoubtedly saved the fire or saved the house from becoming much more involved and the damage was relatively minor in this incident. Uh, three water related calls occurred in June that required fire department response, including the drowning that happened at Beach Area 2 on June 12th. Uh, the young man in his early 20s was described as a weak swimmer and drowned when he fell off his inflatable and was unnoticed by his friends. The other two incidents had a more positive outcome. Fire department staff have been working on rebuilding the roof on our training facility behind station one and we're just down to some finishing touches so that project will be complete in the next week or so. All the work in this project was done by fire department staff. It was some on duty staff, some come in uh, on their own time, volunteer firefighters also helped out so this this project came in within budget and that was covered by a grant uh, provided through the fire marshal's office. And with all the pre precipitation that we've had, our fire danger rating in Wasaga Beach is currently at low. And that, Mr. Chair, is my report for the month. Thank you, Chief. Uh, like right now, I'd like to just turn it over to staff to make any comments or questions. Um, not seeing any, I just to make a couple of quick ones. Your 800 plus um, occurrences so far in June. I think uh, if that keeps up, uh, Chief, you're probably going to have a record season of occurrences. Um, and just a quick question, if you have any update on how station number two is, is moving along as far as the rentals. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we have engaged uh, an architect and we're working on, on the plans. Um, we have all our um, you know, our soil testing and, and site survey and all that stuff is underway. Uh, we have gone out with um, um, a pre-qualification uh, request and uh, received 21 submissions. So we're going through those now and that's for a contractor. Um, so the process is, is moving along well. Thank you, Chief. Um, if there's no other comments or questions, I'll read the uh, motion. Resolve that the community service section of coordinated committee receive the June 2021 fire department report for information. May I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Council Blanchet and Councillor Watson. All in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous six to zero. Uh, now we're going to move into the consent agenda. Um, at this time, I've been notified that Council Blanche um, has pulled a um, item 3.5.3. Um, Her Worship has pulled 3.5.6. Um, at this time, councillors, is there any other items that you would wish to be pulled? Seeing none at this time, and I thank you. I'm going to read the um, consent agenda. Resolve that the community service section of the coordinated committee hereby receives the June or July 2021 consent agenda items 3.4 through 3.3.6, and that all of the recommendations contained therein adopted, excluding the agenda items pulled previously mentioned from the motion and voted on separately. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Council Blanche and Deputy Mayor Bray. All in favor? Thank you, that moves six to zero unanimously. Okay. We'll move down to 3.5.3 and I'll, I'll read the, um, the motion first and get a mover and seconders and then we'll open it up. Um, that the community service section of coordinated committee does hereby receive the recreation events and facilities 
monthly activity report for information. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Watson and her, his worship. And Councillor um, Belanger, please go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. Uh, yeah, I have a, a comment and then uh, also uh, uh, some comment or some questions. But uh, first of all, I want to congratulate our uh, Director of uh, Facilities and Events uh, and Recreation uh, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, even through COVID, uh, we uh, seem to have a lot of activity and I believe we're very uh, well positioned to ramp up as we enter uh, phase three of openings. Uh, the particular item uh, that I have a question on is the relocation of uh, Jazz in the Park to the Klondike Sports Park. I'm not sure if uh, the decision was made prior to the announcement of uh, phase three opening, uh, but uh, there has been some concern expressed as to the convenience of that location, but also from the organizers of the farmer's market who feel that there's a significant synergy between uh, the success of the market and uh, the jazz in the park being held in the area of the Recplex and the gazebo. So I certainly have uh, attended a number of those events and uh, with moving up to uh, the availability of 100 participants, uh, social distancing, uh, I would uh, like council to, uh, or the command team to reconsider uh, moving jazz in the park back to the recplex location. Thank you. Well, I, I can. My apologies. Uh, yes, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor Belanger, uh, I would only say that I, I suspect most councillors uh, do understand that uh, the rationale behind moving Jazz uh, out to the uh, sports park was so that we had ample space. But also keep in mind that uh, there is some parking congestion. Certainly, uh, a, a good uh, third of our 300 parking spots at the Recplex are preoccupied with the Serpentine Line that we're using on Tuesdays, uh, typically out to at least 8 a.m. with the uh, COVID vaccination clinic. And at, at this point, uh, knowing that the YMCA is uh, uh, set to reopen as well as other activities uh, at the Lions Hall and the town uh, halls at the Recplex, I suspect that we will have to have some careful consideration uh, if we bring uh, our uh, Jazz in the Park concert back, uh, just because we may run out of space but uh, it is understood that gathering sizes are growing and that we won't have to limit social distancing. Although today, the sports park will still help us, I, I would say next Tuesday, because we are required to uh, maintain social distancing and that may be a little bit cumbersome uh, over at the gazebo. We have decided not to use Outback. It, it just doesn't work with all the cars that are moving through our drive-through COVID uh, uh, vaccination clinic. Uh, clinic. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Um, I see um, Councillor Watson, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would agree with Councillor uh, Blanche that, you know, maybe in maybe in the short term for a couple of weeks or something until we get the parking situated, but I'd really like it to move back with the farmer's market. I, I think that's a natural fit. It's been a fit for many years and I think it works well. Uh, I, I, I agree that the parking may be a problem right now, but I'd really like consideration to move it back there as soon as uh, feasibly possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson and Her Worship, please. Thank you. Similar to um, those comments, if it's on a temporary basis, um, you know, I get that and it, and it makes sense. Um, in a command meeting uh, we had yesterday, you know, there was discussion about um, the clinics and things, um, th those will look different or change in the in the coming weeks so maybe they the parking lot won't be taken up as much as what it is now so um, if it needs to be done for for a few weeks and, and look at that but I think discussions should happen with um, our deputy fire chief who's been looking after the, the COVID clinics and things for us and see if um, in a few weeks that we could move it back. Thank you worship and Councillor Wells please. Uh, thank you uh, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I'm, I'm certainly of, of the view that the, the, the gazebo has been the location for a long time and, and it's an ideal location. Um, I do think though that it does need some time before uh, we tend to move that. I've been by the last couple of weeks uh, for the farmer's market uh, and they have a number of vendors uh, actually over on the trail uh, running from the gazebo back towards the playground space. Uh, so when you look at uh, the amount of uh, vehicle spacing and the ability to space people, uh, it is very tenuous in there with, uh, with the, uh, the farmer's market. I'm happy to see the farmer's market being so successful, but uh, if they are going to occupy the uh, space uh, basically beside the, uh, the, the washroom facility uh, out to the creek, as well as the parking lot area, and I understand why they're doing that uh, because of the limitation in the parking lot. Uh, it does provide a, a, a difficulty for the people moving in and out of that part of the uh, of the uh, farmers market because they have to go through the gazebo area to the bridge to get back to the, the parking lot area on the other side. So uh, I think there's a need to really look at the congestion that's going to be created if we try it this time to move it back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Well, uh, Councillor Wells. Um, I am. Um, I, I'm. Oh, is any more comments from Council? Not seeing any. I'll just make a, a few quick ones. Um, I also feel that if it's on a temporary basis, I can understand why. But as the fellow councillors have mentioned, um, I see that the gazebo is a good fit, and I'm hoping that as months roll on. Um, the need for the different <clears throat> venues and stuff will decrease and we'll be able to get back to some kind of a comfort level. Um, that being said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, um, Deputy Mayor, please go ahead. Thanks. I just thought of something for the farmer's market. I know that uh, economic development has a program where musicians um, can be positioned at different businesses and I wonder if maybe the farmers market could apply for their own musician in the short term so that there is music at the market um, so the town can kind of maybe help them that way in the interim uh, because I think with, with the limits of 100 it would be very hard to relocate Jazz in the Park back to the Recplex because I'm not sure how you would count the numbers in attendance uh, in that field so Anyway, just, just a thought for the farmer's market. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, not seeing any other questions. Could I um, call for a vote, please? All in favor? Thank you, that's unanimous six to zero. Moving on to <clears throat> Uh, five, or sorry, 3.3.5.6, three point, uh, uh, Director of Public Works Recreation, I will um, uh, read the motion, call for a mover and a seconder, that the Community Service Section of Coordinated Committee recommend Council to direct staff to incorporate a six hole disc golf course feature on a trial basis. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Deputy Mayor Bray and Councillor Wells. Uh, Your Worship, you're the one that pulled it. Could you um, go ahead, please? Thank you. I, I pulled it so that staff could uh, answer some of the questions and uh, speak to them publicly. Uh, we have had some concerns raised um, just as recently as this morning, a couple of emails. But uh, just for clarity, I did reach out to a staff member who was with the organization for literally um, decades and uh, no longer with, with us now, but um, confirmed that there was limestone uh, screenings in uh, the southwest corner for an infield ball diamond. Uh, he said no, no fencing was installed or anything like that, uh, but that was at least over you know, 18 years ago. So there, there was some concerns that you know, there was never a ball diamond, but uh, I did confirm today with someone who was here that, uh, that that 
is what was happening. Um, but otherwise, I, I really have no other questions. It was more for staff to answer some questions that have been raised. Thanks. Uh, Josh or Kevin, please. Wonderful. Yep. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Your Worship, and uh, Council. Uh, I'll just start by giving a bit of a background uh, as to how we came across uh, starting this project. Uh, we had some uh, some really good success last year with implementing a uh, very uh, uh, beginner uh, introductory disc golf course uh, behind the Recplex. Uh, we were able to start a number of programs back there, uh, our summer camps, the Y summer camp utilized the facility, uh, the youth center was over there a few nights, and then we had some really successful seniors programs start as well. Uh, as you know, uh, we've got the COVID testing center and the, uh, the vaccination center behind the RecPlex this year. So this started as sort of a simple proposal to relocate that uh, disc golf facility and continue to provide this service to the community. Uh, we did have a number of uh, pictures to social media from local families posting about how, uh, how much they enjoyed that uh, little disc golf course we had behind the RecPlex. And uh, we thought it was important to, uh, um, to keep that available and, uh, you know, through COVID provide those outdoor recreation options. Um, we did have a chance to look at some other areas. Uh, Pridham Park is a beautiful park and it does offer a, a great location uh, for families to, uh, to gather to do these sort of activities. Uh, we did look at Arnell Park, uh, but that is an open field. It doesn't really offer the challenges that we, uh, that disc golfers seek. Uh, they like the tree elements and uh, bends and twists in the courses and that kind of thing. Uh, we looked at the sports park. It's similar uh, facility to Arnell. And then we also walked the barn property uh, beside, uh, beside the sports park. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very wet land back there uh, for stray discs. And uh, there was also uh, numerous uh, or uh, densely populated bugs. It was, it was very buggy when we were back there. So uh, we thought from the uh, um, walking through there, the public probably wouldn't utilize that uh, that section of land. Uh, further, uh, we did have a, um, a look at, at those properties with Jeff, who you heard a presentation from this morning. So he was off, able to offer us some professional feedback about that. Uh, he did ask, or he has introduced this uh, UDISC uh, system, which is the QR code that you can scan on your phone. Uh, this is a great tool for town staff. We're going to be able to really uh, map out the holes. People are going to be able to track their scores, and we're going to be able to look at the participation numbers and the impact uh, that we're having in the community with that, uh, with that system. Uh, those can be placed right on signs, so it's, uh, it's going to be super easy and tech-friendly for, uh, for our participants. Um, I was happy to hear Jeff touch on the noise levels this morning uh, after her worship's question. I think that was, uh, uh, that was an important one. And then lastly, uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, we did have a, a, a good walk around Pridham Park uh, on numerous occasions. Um, the approximate length of that course uh, will be about 45 minutes of activity, uh, reduced to six holes. And I just wanted to speak to a washroom perspective on that, because I know we're gonna be chatting about that a little bit later, it's for operations, but I think that's an important consideration uh, when we're talking about portable outhouses and stuff. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Josh. Um, Councilor Blanje, please. Thank you, Councilor Kenny. Uh, also reading uh, quite a number of the resident comments, uh, I, I would say that uh, I uh, snowshoed uh, uh, a number of times uh, through the winter in that area. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't find the the parking to be an issue, even though there were others out there while we were there. Uh, I I didn't hear any complaints through that about uh, garbage vehicles or anything not being able to turn around due to people in the parking. So I, I would support a trial and to, to get a better understanding. Uh, uh, certainly, we snowshoed for more than forty five minutes, and washroom facilities were were not a problem uh, to my knowledge uh, during the, the winter months. Uh, the one question I would have though is, because uh, I'm not familiar with exactly where the positioning of the holes are, is that 
given the trails that are back there, would the uh, disc golf coexist uh, well with people hiking or uh, snowshoeing in the winter? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, Councillor Belanger. Uh, I think uh, I think the disc golfing community is is a friendly uh, community to uh, to put that out there first and foremost. The plan right now is to not have the disc golf holes in place during the winter months, so I, I don't think it'll affect the snowshoeing uh, um, uh, recreation activity uh, at all. And then um, I, what I've one thing I talked to Jeff about and I thought was really interesting is where these disc golf locations are popping up. Uh, specifically in the cities, they're uh, they're actually starting to incorporate different picnic areas uh, through those disc golf courses. So they're kind of multi-functioning right now, and uh, I think that's something that Pridham Park is very conducive to with the fallen trees and the logs that are in there already. Uh, the trees offer some nice, safe picnic areas. Uh, we've talked uh, with parks. I think there are uh, um, there are some plans down there that might allow for uh, some wood chips to be spread in those picnic or those potential uh, sitting areas. So I, I think uh, other recreation activities and disc golf meld well together. Thank you, Josh. Um, uh, Mr. Lalonde, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, certainly there were a few, uh, several comments and concerns brought forward relative to um, Predham Park being considered for this trial period. Um, as you noted, uh, as noted in the report, there were planning permissions uh, and concerns related to zoning. Uh, there were environmental concerns noted, logistical concerns relative to parking and turning maneuvers, uh, maintenance concerns relative to litter. Uh, Josh had talked about the, uh, the porta potties and the washing concerns. Uh, we tried to address those within the context of the report, um, and I won't certainly elaborate too much on the planning permissions, but uh, this is a park which is permitted within uh, the EP lands and this type of recreational activity is permitted within a park. So from the zoning perspective, um, the planning permissions are in place to continue with this trial. From an environmental perspective, um, you know, the endangered species concerns, the conservation authority permissions, we did meet out on site with the NVCA and their planning ecologists and, and walk through the course. We walked through uh, the the uh, general layout of the course. Uh, what's particular, you know, what's what's important to note is there is no site alteration being proposed with this uh, proposal. There's there's no grading, there's no construction, there's no tree removal. We're trying to leverage the existing open space and and the maintained areas that that we do have out there. And from the planning and certainly the NVCA ecologist perspective, we have that clearance and there's no permit required given uh, the proposed use. Uh, logistically, um, concerns relative to parking. I guess we are fortunate. Uh, we do have a, a large cul-de-sac at the end of Pridham Court uh, without any residential driveways fronting the cul-de-sac. And conservatively, we know we could fit at least eight, possibly upwards of 10 cars within that cul-de-sac alone around the perimeter. We don't know for sure what level of uh, parking requirements will uh, there will be ultimately, and, and that is why it certainly needs to be monitored. And, and we know that the local neighbors will uh, help keep us informed of those parking uh, challenges down there. Uh, we did reach out to Simcoe County Waste Management Services just to uh, ensure that there's no conflict with turning movements should there be parking at the end of the cul-de-sac. And we've come up with a, a solution to address that in terms of restricting some parkings in the event that they do need to make a three-point uh, three turn. And they didn't have any concerns with that. But again, we also committed to monitoring that and, and making sure they keep us informed of uh, any conflicts or concerns they have in case we have to extend those uh, restrictions. Um, we, we reached out to fire services and there are no concerns with respect to the parking or the proposal relative to fire response and access. And we do have parking, uh, the parking bylaw. We do have permissions within our parking bylaw right now to address parking infractions. That's, you know, obstructing traffic, parking in front of hydrants, obstructing driveways. We do have those permissions now and we'll continue to leverage those uh, as we monitor this uh, scenario. Um, I, I just quickly looked at a number of uh, similar type cul-de-sacs um, that are utilized for alternate purposes. Uh, similarly to Pridham Court that don't have uh, residential driveways. Woodland Woodland Drive, the end of Woodland Drive, the cul-de-sac, that's heavily used by parking 
uh, to access the trails and the China Bowl, and then we haven't had issues or concerns brought forward from parking at the end of that cul-de-sac, similar in size, a 30 meter diameter. Uh, we know would uh, also Wildwood Drive, the access to the Carly Patterson Trail, they do, they do park at the end of that cul-de-sac. And as well, the end of Knox Road East, uh, we've actually created parking stalls for the fishermen and uh, the trailers access for, for canoe launches at the end of Knox Road East. And that's a similar type arrangement where we have permitted parking. Um, in fact, I'm not really aware of any cul-de-sacs per se that are restricted uh, with parking in town, but again, there are, there is a parking bylaw where we can leverage uh, any parking infractions that, that may be. And we're confident the neighborhood will keep us informed of uh, those types of concerns and we can consider those and, and take them into consideration uh, accordingly. Um, I believe from the maintenance perspective, um, you know, there, there, we do cut the grass every couple of weeks and, and we'll continue to, to do so. There will be uh, garbage collection uh, now at the park in terms of setting up uh, a barrel for, for waste management. And we'll collect that as we, as we uh, maintain the park itself with the mowing operations. Uh, the porta potty is something is still under review in terms of establishing a porta potting out on site. Just we haven't deployed uh, many porta potties this year, just given the cleaning frequency and disinfection requirements associated with that due to COVID. So uh, that's something that's uh, still under consideration, and we're hopeful that we can come up with a solution there. But uh, we're also promoting, um, you know, alternate modes of transportation to get to the site in terms of setting up a bike rack so people can bike locally to the park and not have to rely on the car and have a nice uh, bike rack in place for them to, uh, to secure their uh, bikes. So uh, that's a high level, uh, um, I think, comments on the kind of the technical issues that have been brought forward. And, and we're hopeful that uh, collectively we can continue to monitor and address any major concerns that come forward. So uh, this this is a success because we, we do see some potential with this public park and it's certainly underutilized. And in fact, some people don't even know it exists. So, um, and, and, and I mean some in the neighborhood. So it, it's nice to, uh, to develop this type of uh, recreational activity for the neighborhood as well. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I have Councillor Watson and then Deputy Mayor Bray, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I just have one, one question. Was the immediate neighborhood community um, involved with discussing this happening with, with the park? Was, did staff speak with anyone? Was there any literature put out to the people in the neighborhood um, to get their comments before the decision was made to bring a report forward with it. That, that's my main question and I have a, a comment. Thank you, Councilor Watson. Uh, Josh or Kevin, please. Uh, I, I think it was evident from when the first report came forward at committee um, that there was some concerns from the neighborhood. Um, again, as Josh indicated earlier, um, it, at first, you know, glance, uh, the relocation seemed relatively um, a simple relocation given the circumstances, but uh, obviously from those comments we received via email uh, is why that report was pulled and, and we're trying to address them here, Councillor. So no, I guess is the, uh, the answer. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Um, yeah, just subsequent. Um, I'm supportive of the disc golf. I'm supportive. Uh, you know, we've dotted uh, dotted our eyes and crossed our t's. We've we've looked at uh, most of the issues that were there, but the one that stands out for me is you know the people in the neighborhood are saying that you know they really weren't involved in in the process. They found out about it a little bit later. Um, they've expressed their concerns uh, on there, and it does affect the neighborhood. I, I know how I would feel, and a lot of people that you know all of a sudden something's coming into a neighborhood, good, bad, or indifferent. So I won't be supporting it based on uh, what I perceive as a lack of communication with the neighborhood. Uh, other than that, I, I think staff has done a wonderful job with it. The presentation was great. It's a great sport. I think it would be really good there, but it's, I, I, think, I think we missed the boat by not engaging more with the people in the neighborhood. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Deputy Mayor Bray, please. Thank you. Uh, I think in light of COVID and the 
um, you know, the idea came forward from staff to relocate this. I did have residents asking me where the disc golf was. I was blindly sending them to the recplex. You know, they would get there and realize that that the course was no longer there. So I think that, you know, staff reacted quickly to relocate it in light of the COVID clinic. And I was uh, disappointed that the neighborhood, you know, got as upset as they did. I'm not sure that they fully understand. Um, it's shit great that they brought forward their concerns. I'm thoroughly impressed with the way staff have handled all those concerns. Um, this is a trial. That is a public park. And I think as members of council, we have a duty to make sure that our parks are used. And, um, you know, I took, took the opportunity, rode my bike over there, bumped into all kinds of uh, neat birds and uh, a turkey or two and a deer. Like it's a, a beautifully well-kept secret park, I think. And uh, if we can open that up to, to more residents to access it, it's, it's awesome. We live in a great place and I think sharing that with other people is, is a great idea. My only concern would be the one entry off of Club Court. Uh, when I went to ride my bicycle down that hill, it's, it's kind of um, steep. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether you should just put a sign at the top of it or you could do something to make that a little safer grading, but I found it a little, um, I walked my bike down, but uh, luckily I might not have made it down if I had ridden my bicycle, so my only concern with the whole project and it's a trial so I really look forward to the feedback uh, including that from the neighbors who may be able to get out and try disc golf and find that they like it so thank you thank you deputy mayor um is there any many any more comments from councillors um not see oh I'm sorry uh councillor wells please thank you mr chair I think uh, a couple of comments one with respect to the parking issue um, and I appreciate uh, what uh, Kevin has dug up uh, around the, the cul-de-sac. But I think we need to keep in mind, although it might be just a slightly longer uh, hike down into the park, that there is a fair amount of parking at the tennis court and uh, pickleball courts um, at the end of uh, Morgan Road. And we also, I believe, I stand to be corrected by uh, the staff, but I believe we own property uh, at the corner of Morgan Road and uh, Club the Court uh, that potentially uh, could be used if necessary to enhance some of the parking areas out there. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I just thought there was some piece of property that we might have some ownership of there. Um, the other comment I have is that I think we have to keep in mind that this is a town park. Uh, it's there for all the residents of the town and, and we try to provide amenities in every park uh, to meet some of the needs of the, of the local community, whether it be a children's playground park or whether it be just a picnic area for park resident for uh, residents or whether it just be a hiking trail. But it is a town park and it should be there and should be for the use of all residents. And, uh, and we should be looking to provide uh, opportunities for residents to enjoy that park and have uh, some activity to draw them to it. So um, I will be supporting the recommendation to go forward with the pilot. Um, I, I certainly un understand that there are concerns from some residents and they've been very vocal with, uh, through email about those concerns, but I believe that Kevin and Josh have, and the presentation earlier today have responded to uh, if not all, most of those concerns. And I think we need to uh, give this a chance to go forward and who knows, it, they may find that the, the uh, club court, uh, Pridham court uh, community may find themselves wanting in, in the future to actually make use of this park for their own community events. Because I do know that as a community, they get together for various social events and here's an ideal opportunity for them to have something to do. So. I'm definitely supportive of it. I think it's a great place and I, I think the location is ideal. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Um, uh, is there any more comments from councillors before I see if- uh, Councillor Kenny, I believe oh, uh, that our Director of Public Works has some comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Councillor Blanche. Uh, Kevin, please go ahead. My apologies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just just in in closing, uh, both Josh and I, as well as as Jeff, uh, the presenter earlier on, we have 
had discussions about potentially bringing Jeff in and, and giving like an information or almost a coaching type session on the sport of disc golf and, and how to play it. And, and uh, when Jeff came up to demonstrate uh, the sport with, with myself and Josh and, and the operations manager, uh, we were surprised to learn just the different varieties of even the discs. You know, he has a bag similar to a golf club bag with a dozen discs or so, and they're numbered with four numbers. That add-on, I think that was important. And thank you, Councilor Blanche, for recognizing that. Um, just very quickly, I'm in favor of moving this one forward. I think it's a unique um, opportunity, as uh, Councilor Wells has mentioned and other councilors, that the parks are there for everybody to use. And it is a pilot or a, a trial. Um, and as we move forward, we'll learn whether or not that's a good place, a bad place, or everybody just enjoys it. That being said, I'll be quiet, Council, and I'll call for a vote, please. All in favor? Uh, any against, please? Thank you. That moves five to one with Councilor Watson in a opposal. Um, right now, unless there's anything else pulled, Council, um, the community service section of this committee is almost over, but before they do that, I'm gonna make a quick announcement. Um, on the 14th of July, Logan Bell, my new grandson was born, and uh, I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you, Council, and Councillor Watson, please go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Kinney, and congratulations to you and in your family, that's a very happy event. Uh, we're now moving into the public works section of the agenda. Um, we have no deputations, presentations, petitions, or public meetings. We have two items under unfinished business that will be coming forward at a future time. We have uh, no other uh, agency reports. Uh, we now move into the consent agenda, and my understanding was there was an item pulled, but that has been withdrawn, I believe. So if that is correct, we have no items pulled under consent agenda. So I'll read the motion, get a mover and a seconder. Uh, resolve that the public works section of coordinated committee hereby receives the July 15, 2021 consent agenda items 4.4 through to 4.6 and that all the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding agenda items pulled from the motion and voted on separately. May I have a mover for this, please? Uh, Councillor Kinney and a seconder, please. Councillor Wells. And is there any discussion at this time on anything? Seeing none, um, those in favor of that motion. Thank you very much. That carries unanimously. Great. And that's the end of the public work section, I guess, sorry. We need a, we need a 10 minute break at this point. Okay, we're, we're at, looks like 10 o'clock. So 10-10, does that sound good? Thank you.
and we're live. Thank you. Hey, welcome back to Coordinated Committee. We're reconvening at 1010 with the Development Services section of Coordinated Committee. Uh, deputations, presentations, petitions, and public meetings, we have none. Unfinished business, there's a couple of items that uh, remain there, but I haven't seen any questions. Uh, other agency reports, there are none. We have a consent agenda today, and I have three items that were potentially pulled. 5.5.1, 5.5.5, and this was Councillor Watson. Did you wish to just make a comment or did you want this pulled for a separate vote, Councillor Watson? 5.5.5? Yeah. I was just going to speak to it and highlight a couple of things from the report. So whichever way you want me to handle it. Okay, so I think we, we can speak to that as part of the consent agenda. So we'll pull 5.5.1 and 5.5.8. So then if you would like to speak to that item, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, commend uh, our economic development staff for this uh, for this report. It's a, it's a very important document um, going forward, and I just want to highlight a couple of things and uh, a couple of words that have been th uh, sprinkled throughout the report. Uh, under the discussion section, uh, it states the intent is to increase local employment, attract working age residents, and build a sustainable and complete community. And a couple, two of the priorities that they have highlighted is support the private sector in growing and diversifying our tax base and build relationships with outside organizations and stakeholders based on mutual respect uh, for, uh, for the different roles that are played in the development of a community. And the very next paragraph also talks in the last sentence about a community development that will allow the municipality to obtain the goal of creating and facilitating opportunities to create a sustainable and complete community for Wasaga Beach. So, that's what we're trying to build, this council. These are some of our priorities. And I think it's uh, it's always, uh, well, recently anyway, an incorrect statement that said all the time that we're a tourist community. I've said uh, on multiple occasions that we are a complete, uh, vibrant and growing community that has a tourism component to it. So we're looking to uh, enhance uh, all aspects of our community. So thank you for the report and I'm fully in support of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson. So I will read the consent agenda that resolved the Development Services Section of Coordinated Committee hereby receives the July 15, 2021 consent agenda, items 5.4 through to 5.6, and that all the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding agenda item 5.5.1, 5.5.8, which have been pulled and will be voted on separately. Did I get a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Kinney and uh, Mayor Bifolci, all in favor? And that carries unanimously. Okay, so the next item would be 5.5.1, subdivision uh, condominium matters regarding Brook Valley Wasaga Limited. And this was pulled by Councillor Belanger. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Mayor Bray. Yes, I'm pulling the item because I uh, will be voting in opposition to this. I had voted in opposition to the uh, original amendments to the site plan or the subdivision agreement where we removed four standard clauses that uh, were in all our uh, developments and consolidated that. In my opinion, it's not in the best interest of our community to uh, give a developer uh, the go-ahead to complete uh, site preparation work prior to them receiving the MECP uh, confirmation and approval that the lands in question are not uh, significant wildlife or endangered species habitat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heron. I know this report is, I'll wait for Mr. Heron to join us. Uh, this report is being received today for information, but I just wondered if you could maybe address those uh, concerns of Councillor Belanger's. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, further to the discussion at Council on the report uh, that Councillor Belanger initially um, uh, commented on, the manner where that the, um, the legislation for endangered species 
how it works is that it's developer responsibility to ensure that um, they adhere to the requirements of that act. Um, and the developer is required to do an initial um, assessment of any issues related to endangered species on the site prior to site alteration occurring. And uh, through the act, uh, if, if there is no issues, um, development can occur. Um, and that is um, aside from any approvals that the town would be looking at in terms of proper development and proper uh, criteria for the development of the lands. Um, the rationale behind uh, installing this condition is simply that um, in the town issuing approval, we're stating it and making it very clear to the developer that their responsibility um, is to the Endangered Species Act and that site alteration will not occur until they've satisfied that act. So, uh, and that's the approach that's been taken from other agencies. The uh, Nottawa Saga Valley Conservation Authority applies the same type of condition in their permitting approvals. And we've uh, polled other municipalities, for instance, um, Township of Georgian Bay does the same thing. Um, so there, it's, uh, there is a bit, a bit of a distinction between the town approval process for site alteration and what's required under the Endangered Species Act. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bifolci, I saw your card go up. Thank you. I just, um, for the public, I don't want them to be um, misled with um, comments that were made. The MECP did have input into um, the, the, um, the previous staff report that, that was brought forward dealing with this. So it's not like we're, we're doing something that the MECP did, doesn't know about. Um, they were part of that uh, discussion prior to that coming forward. So to say that, um, you know, they don't have MECP approval and things like that. This this was done in uh, great uh, in-depth research and, and input from them prior to us already discussing this at council and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I don't know the answer to this, so I'm gonna ask uh, through the chair to Mr. Heron. Um, Councillor Blanche mentioned about these clauses being pulled and it's unique that it's in all the agreements and we don't pull them for other ones. Is, is, is that a correct uh, statement? Um, or, and um, should we be pulling it for other ones? I, I guess if that is, is correct, so thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Watson and through you to Madam Chair. The, um, the approach is that uh, up until last month when council considered this matter, the, um, the town required clearances from MECP. What we learned is that the MECP does not actually um, issue clearances to municipalities. Um, they work directly with the landowner. Uh, so the answer to the question is that going forward, um, staff will be applying a similar condition in future applications. Uh, so conditions of draft approval of plan of subdivision, conditions of site prep um, alterations, conditions of site surfacing alteration, uh, and we will carry this condition forward. Um, thank you. Follow up, Councillor Watson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for that answer. That, that that's great. That's what my suspicion was. Is it's uh, something that uh, that we've learned, and we'll be applying this across the board with everyone. So, thank you, and I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Councillor Blanchet. Yes, uh, just two questions. Uh, that that being the case, uh, this uh, this development uh, prior to them uh, raising uh, the concern uh, about the interpretation of the act uh, was a former development. So if we are changing it for them, why wouldn't we change it for all of the developments that are currently on file? Uh, as opposed to just saying going forward except for this one. But my other question would be, in the event that a developer were to proceed with site preparation work without proper MECP uh, confirmation and approvals, uh, and were found uh, to be in violation, uh, they, they would be subject to a fine, which I'm sure, uh, but would, uh, the way it was uh, done before with them also requiring that for the town approval, would they not 
also be subject to penalty uh, from the town uh, if they proceeded. So are we are we moving, uh, removing a layer of deterrent? And I'm not suggesting that that would ever happen. I, I don't know if it's happened in the past, uh, but to me, it was just an extra layer of protection to ensure that all of the environmental concerns are uh, dealt with by the developer uh, very effectively. Thank you. Um, thank you through you, Madam Chair. Uh, at, at this point, um, staff are not looking to um, bring forward currently approved conditions of draft approval to amend them. Um, I can't think of too many that are out there. We have um, multiple ones that are forthcoming uh, that we will be putting that condition into. In terms of um, having knowledge of uh, any species at risk issues on sites, through the official plan, the town does require developers to submit environmental impact statements or in environmental impact studies uh, along with their submission package for a complete application. So in this manner, um, the town is aware of any environmental issues that might be affecting the site. Um, and albeit that um, under the Endangered Species Act, uh, those matters for endangered species are addressed through the MECP, we are aware of them through the, the submission of that study that we require. So uh, there is some eyes on the situation and um, we do have staff uh, um, you know, who visit the site on a fairly regular uh, basis and understand where and when site alteration is occurring. So there is a little bit of oversight and um, we would have a responsibility to report uh, any indiscretions if, if they were to occur. Thank you. Seeing no more comments or questions, I will read the, uh, the motion. The Development Services Section of Coordinated Committee recommend to Council that it receive the report of the Senior Planner regarding request for site preparation agreement by Brook Valley Wasaga Limited for the land subject to draft plan of subdivision PS0215 for information. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Mayor by Fulci and Councillor Kinney, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, so that would carry 5 1 with Councillor Belanger in opposition. Thank you. The next item is uh, item 5.5.8, and uh, this was request to temporarily permit a third mobile food trailer on private property. This was pulled as I've declared a conflict of interest. So I would like to pass the chair over to Councillor Wells, please. We lost him. <laughs> Are you there, Councillor Wells? If not, I could pass the uh, the chair over to uh, Mayor Bifolci. I think I got it. Okay, I will back out. <laughs> Pushing all the wrong buttons. The uh, the motion. Uh, read the motion first, and then open it to any discussion. Uh, Resolved that Development Services Section of Coordinated Committee recommend to Council that it decline the special request attached as Appendix A received from the owner of 9 Main Street. You heard the, uh, but I have a mover and a seconder for the motion. Councillor Kinney and uh, Mayor Bifolci. Uh, is there any discussion of this matter? Seeing none, uh, I'm sorry, George, you wish to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe the uh, Director of uh, Planning and Economic Initiatives wanted us to point something out in the report that uh, is not quite right. So we just want to make sure that uh, for the record, it's uh, it's corrected. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, Caitlin, you wish to uh, add something or amend something? Uh, I'll follow Doug after he spoke. Oh, okay. Hey, Doug. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I simply wanted to clarify that um, in line with Council's direction to change the official plan and to amend the zoning bylaw for Beach Area 1, um, that bylaw was approved and in it, 
um, staff included a new definition for takeout restaurant slash food truck. And uh, knowing that Beach Area One would be under development for uh, the imminent future and uh, for some years to come, uh, the intent was to allow for food trucks in Beach Area One because, the, you know, as buildings get demolished, uh, there would be a period where uh, the public who attend Beach Area One would still need to have uh, refreshments and, and food and takeout. So the bylaw has been passed. It's been through the appeal period. It is in force. It does allow food trucks as of right uh, down at Beach Area One. So oh. I think the report uh, stipulates that there would be um, a requirement, if it was approved by council, um, a requirement to waive um, the conditions of zoning. That's not needed. The, con the zoning is actually met. It is a, an outright permitted use at this point in time. Ms. Caitlin, go ahead. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. So as outlined in the report, the property is still subject to a site plan review. And in addition, it's still subject to the 100 meter separation distance requirement from existing uh, restaurants. And so it doesn't meet this requirement and therefore the recommendation within the report still stands. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so my question now is, uh, we have approved two previous trucks on this site uh, as a special amendment uh, as a variance or whatever we want to call it uh, because the owners had um, bricks and mortar restaurants somewhere else in town and, and we were trying to help them through the COVID thing. So am I understanding you correctly, Doug, that uh, those other two trucks did, did not or do not require uh, anything from council, they are quite legitimate, just the way they just, uh, on the basis of I want to put a food truck on Beach Drive, I can do it. Uh, thank you. Uh, the um, Those two approvals were granted uh, prior to the zoning bylaw be amended. So there was a requirement to, for council to waive the, the zoning criteria. Council also waived site plan. Um, and I'm not sure about business licensing. Um, currently, with the bylaw changed, you're quite right. Those former, those two food trucks would be outright permitted, um, and any food truck would be outright permitted. And the criteria would still be applicable to: Do they comply with site plan? Do they comply with the minimal parking requirements? Do they comply with um, business licensing? In this instance, business licensing still does require. Uh, separation distance from other established restaurants. Um, I'm not completely familiar with that bylaw. So there, there continues to be some criteria, um, which is explained in the report, uh, which supports the recommendation of the report. I think the simple change is that uh, we've, we've just changed the bylaw to now allow food trucks as of right. Uh, it's just a matter of um, locating them and uh, separation distances. Okay, I'm now about to give myself a good kick because I don't certainly was not did not make myself aware somehow that that was something that we were approving because I certainly do not agree with it. Anyway, it's that's done and I can't do anything about it. But uh, I do not agree that it should have happened. George, George Watson. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Wells. Um, at, at a business task force meeting, I, I expressed uh, opposition to the to the recommendation and, and I, I can't support it today. This, uh, this specifically refers, I believe, to a um, sort of a popcorn uh, producing trailer. And my argument at the time was that the that the proponent of this currently has, I think, two locations uh, on the mall now that they're renting from from a landlord and the 100 meter distance is essentially the same landlord that is wanting to have the, uh, the popcorn machine there um, producing the popcorn to sell to the public. So I thought it would be fitting to have it, to have it there, uh, the existing uh, two businesses that the people own. And uh, it's, it's another, um, uh, what do you call, uh, 
attraction on, on the mall. You, you know, you see the popcorn being made, you get the aroma of the popcorn and that. So I thought it was a good thing to have right now. So I, I can't support the recommendation uh, as I had said previously. Thank you. Councillor Belanger. Thank you, uh, Councillor Wells. Uh, I sort of agree with your comments. Uh, when when we uh, passed the bylaw, like prior to that, I think there was a lot of uh, discussion within council as to uh, a level of concern uh, as during COVID and uh, uh, with everything that's gone on at Beach Drive and uh, how it's impacted visitation and everything else is that there was a, a concern of uh, increasing competition during peak season uh, for businesses that, uh, you know, have uh, in many cases have struggled. And uh, I certainly agree as once the construction starts uh, that we still have to have an offering to, to the public and to tourists. Uh, but even at that, I think there was a thought that uh, we didn't want it to be open season. You know, a hundred, a hundred meters may also be a little misleading because sometimes, uh, again, as uh, Councillor Watson said, you have a you have a vendor that is offering a product that is uh, quite unique to other offerings on the beachfront currently, and may not be uh, deemed as uh, competitive as offering the same items. So maybe it's uh, maybe it's something that we should look at uh, a reconsideration of that bylaw and the timing of the bylaw. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I was just going to say, um, is it possible to refer this to the July 27th council meeting? I always struggle when we get to these meetings and find out that uh, there, there was wrong information in a staff report and that's what we're making a decision on. So um, I would like myself a, a cleaned up staff report that has, uh, I know that uh, we're also hearing that, you know, uh, the business licensing still wouldn't allow it and everything else, but I think to sit here and with a bunch of different opinions now and, and unclear on maybe things in the past that I, I would like to see a, a, a correct report come forward. Okay. George V. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, I just wanted to make a couple of comments with respect to the criteria that the Business Recovery Task Force applied when considering these exemptions. The, uh, there were basically four tests that were applied. One test would be the zoning bylaw. The other test was site plan requirement. The third test was business licensing requirement. And the fourth test was the bricks and mortar. So when looking at each of these uh, applications and, and uh, their the Business Recovery Task Force says, I think this is the fourth one that it's applied or it's reviewed. Um, certainly it was those four things that, or four elements that were applied. And what's been mentioned to you today is that the zoning, the zoning matter, that's set aside now because the zoning permits that, but that's only one, one test that needs to be satisfied. There's still the uh, requirement of site plan and you could argue because it's a trailer, maybe site plan, temporary use, maybe site plan doesn't apply. However, the business license requirement is the third test and that is something that council would have to grant an exemption for in terms of the 100 meter separation. And then the fourth test was something that was evolved from decisions of council was the bricks and mortar. And uh, the two that have been approved all our, our permanent bricks and mortar um, businesses in town that are offering a satellite uh, offering at 10 Main Street. So when looking at these uh, proposals, those were the tests. And unfortunately, as been pointed out, there was an error in the report with respect to the zoning, but the other tests were uh, still apply. Um, and I, I just wanted to point that out, uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, committee's benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Fulci, you indicated wanting to refer it back, I think, is what you were suggesting. You suggested council. I'm wondering if it would be more appropriate to refer it to Committee of the Whole, such that we would have the opportunity to have the discussion there prior to it ending up in front of council for any kind of final decision. Go ahead. Yeah, I, the only reason I suggested council is I thought that we would, um, it would be a sooner uh, meeting and I didn't want to delay someone um, by waiting 
longer. So is, is the next meeting is council. So that's that's why I was suggesting that. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, is there a seconder for the mayor's move to push it back? Councilor Watson? Okay. Uh, to refer it back to council for further review. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? I see none opposed, so it would be a six to uh, zero uh, unanimous decision. I guess I now still have to vote on the original motion. Do I, Dina? You've got your hand there. I was just a five to zero, as uh, Sylvia has declared an interest. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, five to zero. Yes. Okay. Just to clarify, now, there are no Cal meetings in July and August as well. Now, do we need to deal with the original motion, or is it just deferred? It's referred back to staff. Thank you. Okay. And with that, I think I'm kicked out of the chair again, and I'll refer it back to the deputy mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, chairing that portion. And with that, this concludes the development services section of coordinated committee. I am also the chair for general government. So if there is no need for a break, I will move directly into general government. Seeing none, there's no deputations, presentations, petitions, or public meetings today. Uh, the only item of unfinished business is signed bylaw, which is on the agenda today. And we have a consent agenda with only one item that I apologize I had pulled at the last minute, and that is the signed bylaw 6.5.7. So the consent agenda reads, resolved that general government services section of coordinated committee hereby receives the July 15th consent agenda, item 6.4 through to 6.5, and that the recommendations contained therein be adopted, excluding agenda item pulled separately from the motion, which will be voted on separately. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Kinney, Councillor Boulanger, all in favor? That motion carries six to zero. And then the item that I had pulled was 6.5.7, which were changes to the sign bylaw. I'm not sure if anyone else wishes to speak. If not, I will certainly share my concerns. So seeing none, um, I know we had a, a discussion at uh, Core Committee of the Whole probably a month ago, and I made a number of, of recommendations. Um, I speak today as the deputy mayor, but I also speak as a business owner. Uh, these, this bylaw affects me no differently than it affects the other 600 plus businesses in town that have applied for a business license. So there is no conflict of interest here. I do not get special treatment, but I do think that the recommendations or the, the ideas I bring to the table might recommend more of that business community than perhaps those that have been working on this bylaw. So I continue to have concerns with the window signs, the mobile signs, the portable signs. Um, I had questions about parked vehicles. You know, if you have a trailer that's uh, deckled up and you park it in the corner of somebody else's parking lot, where does that fit into this bylaw? So I still have a number of concerns with the way that it's written. I would also like to see an exemption for summer businesses or perhaps winter businesses, seasonal businesses, because at this point we are definitely working towards being a full season community, a full service community but there's a number of businesses, a large number, that probably make the bulk of their income during an eight to, to 12 week period. So I think that these, uh, the sign bylaw is extremely restrictive and it will have a negative impact on those businesses. Um, when we have the vote, if, if it goes through as it is, I would like to request that economic development maybe follow up with the business community um, you know, maybe we launch it as some type of a pilot and we get some feedback from those who will be impacted because I do think if we actually took that time and we went out and we asked those that will be impacted by these changes in this bylaw, that you will get some feedback that would perhaps change the way it was written. So if there's no other comments, I'll call the vote, but I would just like to, to make a, um, a request that economic development, you know, listening in maybe does follow up with the business community. So. And having said that, I have uh, prompted some discussion. So, uh, Councillor Belanger and then Mayor Bifolci. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Bray. Um, 
uh, we we've been uh, certainly rehashing this a, a number of times, and uh, I would agree we're 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 never going to get a bylaw that's uh, that's perfect for everyone. And uh, my my concern is if we if we go out uh, uh, further, uh, we uh, we're going to continue to muddy the waters. So uh, I, I'm certainly willing to uh, try to put something into play. Not to say that it never can be changed in the future, but uh, uh, I think we also have to understand in today's world is uh, signage is only one way to communicate to your uh, possible uh, customers. And uh, certainly uh, as we look on social media, there's many businesses in our town that do an extremely good job. There's others that do a very poor job. And I think there's other opportunities to focus on to ensure a business has success. But I think at some point in time, we have to uh, take a stand and, and, and make an agreement because I, I really believe this could go on for a significant period of time if we just keep asking for more and more opinion. Thank you. Mayor Bifolgi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, um, I'm looking to have my memory jogged uh, and maybe Rachel, you can do that. Did we do a survey with the business community on any of this? No. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, through you, Madam Chair, we, we did do a, a survey um, through the community that I believe was done um, during the end of last year. Um, and it was conducted for, um, I believe, a 60-day period before going back and um, reviewing all of the comments. It would have perhaps been nice if the results of that survey were included in this report because I certainly don't remember it. Um, so again, I will, I will call the vote, but I would, um, I guess this will come back to council so we can continue to discuss it there if we need to. So the motion reads that the general government services section, a coordinated committee recommends to council that the proposed bylaw to prohibit or regulate signs and other advertising devices within the town of Wasaga Beach be brought forward for adoption based on discussion at this meeting. And further that bylaws 9610, 9613-2013-45, 2014-29, 2018-52, 2018-67, and any other associated amending bylaws be repealed. All in favor? Opposed, if any, and that passes five to one. Can I ask for a, mo a mover and a seconder, Dina? No? No, I don't think you did. Who would like to move that? <laughs> Councillor Kinney, seconder? Mayor Bifolci? And does the vote still stand or do I need to call it again? You can certainly call it again to reaffirm. Okay, so all in favor and opposed if any. So again, five to one. Okay, next item on the agenda is uh, the CAO's verbal report regarding COVID-19. Mr. CAO. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, I'm, today I'm joined by our communications coordinator, uh, Mike Jennings, who's gonna get, provide a provincial update and our deputy fire chief, who's gonna provide an update uh, from the health unit. Uh, both of those gentlemen are on standby and I'll turn it back to you. Morning, uh, members of the committee. I just have uh, two points from, from the uh, pro provincial field, if you will, that I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, one is that on uh, July the 8th, uh, the province said that over half of Ontario adults are now vaccinated with their second dose. So that's great news. And as of that date, healthcare workers have administered more than 16 million doses since the start of the vaccine rollout. And the second point that I wanted to share with you uh, is from July the 9th, and it is some great news for our community. Uh, Ontario is moving to step three of the roadmap to reopen on July the 16th, which is tomorrow. Uh, in order to enter step three, Ontario needed to have vaccinated 70 to 80% of individuals 18 years of age or older with one dose and 25% with two doses uh, to ensure a strong level of protection. So 
that's some good news for Wasaga Beach. And those are the two provincial uh, updates that I wanted to share with you. Thank you, Mr. Jennings. Uh, I believe Deputy Chief Williams was next. Thank you very much and good morning. I will provide a uh, very quick breakdown of case counts and local vaccine rates. And then after that, a brief overview of one of our uh, unique programs in Wasega Beach, which we've named the Vaccine Outreach Program. Provincially, there have been 548,000 cases of COVID-19 with 537,000 recoveries and 9,265 deaths. There are 180 individuals that have tested positive and are currently admitted to ICUs across the province. And this includes 89 individuals on ventilators. The current provincial testing positivity rate is 0.6%. And to date, we have conducted over 16.2 million COVID-19 tests. Within the Simcoe Muskoka region, there have been a total of 12,325 cases with 11,605 recoveries and also 254 deaths. There are now 20 cases reported by the health, sorry, there were 20 cases reported by the health unit in the last week, and this is 43% uh, lower than 37 cases that were reported during the week of June 27th, and this is the lowest weekly case count since August of 2020. There are currently uh, four individuals hospitalized in Simcoe County. The seven day moving average of cases within our region is 3.5 cases per day, and our percent positivity is 0.3%. There are no active outbreaks in Simcoe Muskoka and it's been a very long time since I was able to say that. 77% of the residents over 12 years old have now received their first vaccine whereas 54% of uh, residents over 12 are now fully vaccinated. Within Wasaga Beach as of yesterday our case count was 261. Uh, this includes no individuals currently hospitalized and there are 13 individuals that are isolating in our community. The most recent case listed uh, was on June the 29th and Wasaga Beach now has 80% of our community over 12 years old vaccinated with one dose and 55% vaccinated with two doses. So I would like to take just a minute to talk about uh, the, our program uh, again, which is named the Vaccine Outreach Program. The first phase of this program has now been completed. On July 6th and 13th, members of the South Georgian Bay Community Health Center, the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, the Wasaga Beach Bylaw Department, as well as Wasaga Beach Fire Department, visited a total of 13 low income and high, higher density housing locations across town. A total of approximately 500 individual residential units were visited and approximately 200 vaccines were administered, many of them being first doses. Uh, we will be returning to these same locations on August the 11th to deliver second vaccine for those uh, community members that need them. This was a great opportunity to partner and collaborate with our local health teams. Uh, the program was able to successfully identify many community members who have are facing barriers to access vaccine and some of those barriers were cognitive as well as some of them were physical we also ran into a large number of individuals who lacked transportation to get to the max vaccine site uh, we received excellent feedback from community members who took advantage of this program and I did want to commend uh, the nursing staff from both the South Georgian Bay Community Health Center as well as the health unit who are continuing to do an outstanding job and go above and beyond to help our community during one of its most challenging times. And I did want to personally thank them for their leadership and their ongoing support, especially with this initiative. Uh, and with that, that concludes uh, my update today, unless there's any questions. Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to, uh, I was amazed and, and so proud of our community and, and uh, our, our team, our, our different uh, teams throughout the town that took this initiative to go out in the community to go to the people and get the vaccinations in place. I've heard nothing but wonderful compliments from, from the community and, and neighboring uh, municipalities and people from them about that that outreach program. So I really thank you for that. Um, Craig will know of this. I, I asked him a, a question about a week or so ago. There's a lot of organizations, and, and I'm, I'm hearing it 
just on the national news and that, uh, but, but I, I asked, um, there's questions from like service club, like a Rotary Club, Alliance Club, uh, Probus, uh, different organizations that are really wondering what they can and can't do about reopening up and the issue about, it was, it was very straightforward, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, everyone was on the same footing. Everyone, no one was vaccinated. Everyone had to wear a mask. Everyone had to social distance. Now we have vaccinated and non-vaccinated or partially vaccinated. And the question that I'm getting, and I'm, I'm seeing it in, in real life, sitting on the boards of some organizations is how do we approach this going forward? Um, some clubs that require a membership, uh, it comes out, they're saying, well, we'll come back and, and join, but I don't want to play or, or be involved with people that aren't vaccinated. So how do you get those answers? How, what kind of direction can we give uh, being a leader in the community to give some direction to these organizations, what they can and can't do? No one wants to get into a legal jeopardy by uh, human rights issue about asking about this stuff. Um, so it, it, it's a real quandary in some regards because now we're in a complicated area. So that, that was really my concern and question that, that I'm, I'm getting from. Madam Chair, um, unless Craig has a response, I can uh, respond to Councillor Watson. This, this was a subject um, that we discussed at our command team yesterday. Um, there are restrictions that the province has put in place through the implementation of stage three. Uh, our deputy fire chief is our point person with respect to uh, our operational plan and our planning for the rollout of stage three. And um, we don't have all the answers with respect to those particular questions. They, they go beyond what the words say in the, in the regulations, but um, our deputy chief uh, is certainly um, engaged with our health unit on a regular basis. And um, I know the health unit uh, met with the area municipalities this morning and perhaps he has some additional information he can share. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, George. It, it, it's, a, it's a great question and you're absolutely right. It's becoming a complicated time and a time where we all we all want is things to get more simple. Um, what we are starting to see as well um, is a number of the organizations that we work with who submit safety plans to ourselves um, in a lack of in a, in a time where we have a lack of direction are actually coming up with some of their own thoughts and they're saying well our membership must have at least one vaccine or must be fully immunized so I think the quicker we can get some direction uh, the better um, there was a question brought up in this morning's uh, meeting with the health unit uh, that included the municipalities that was along this flavor and we didn't get a very clear answer to it I think that the solution is that the province and the local health unit need to provide us with some direction as to you know how we go about this because until we have that I'm not sure how to advise our community on on you know whether we should treat individuals that are fully vaccinated differently from those that are not vaccinated. Sorry thank you it was interesting to uh, to read yesterday in the news that Seneca College is uh, requiring any students attending in person in September to be uh, doubly vaccinated. So I think now that one institution has kind of stood up and made a decision, we might see more uh, announcements coming soon. Councillor Kinney, did I see your card? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Craig, thank you for your um, update. And you're absolutely right um, with regards to getting uh, guidance from the province and from our health unit. They're always the, the go-to qualified people to take guidance from. But my own thought, and take it as you want, um, I think as individuals, we should be looking after our own safety, both um, from a physical point of view and a mental point of view. Uh, and with regards to this COVID, I was fortunate enough to have two vaccinations. Apparently, the second one doesn't take effect for 14 days. Um, my understanding of vaccines, and please, Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, um, what it does is it um, builds your antibodies in your body so that it can fight the um, evading virus. 
it doesn't mean you don't get it. It just means your body can can um, fight that virus. So my overall thought is one vaccine, two vaccine. Look after your own safety. If you're comfortable wearing a mask when you're with people, do it because that's your own personal privilege. Um, and you know, continue social distancing if that's what you want to do. Um, and wash your hands. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, health unit, provinces are go-to people, but take ownership of your own safety. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Blanchet? Yes, uh, just further to Council or Kenny's uh, Kenny's remarks uh, and uh, to uh, uh, Deputy Chief Williams, uh, is is there at this point is there any legal issue with uh, clubs or anything saying that masking and social distancing uh, inside and social distancing outside are are a requirement of your meetings? Like, I mean, to me that that would be given uh, unclear direction, that, that would be a, at least a, a, a pretty good recommendation. But I, I don't know if someone wanted to refuse wearing a mask because they're vaccinated, whether or not that becomes an issue. Deputy Chief. Uh, so at this point, I, I would think that uh, what we've yet to see is any legal challenges on this matter. And as those evolve, that's where we'll get uh, a better understanding of, of what people's rights are. Uh, that being said, a private business is just that, a private business, it's a private location. And my understanding is much similar to a uh, business who uh, excludes an individual who refuses to wear a mask from their premises. They may have the same you know, opportunity to do this based on vaccine. And just speaking on behalf of a business, you also have that obligation to protect your employees. So you've got the whole Ministry of Labor laws as well as the health unit as well as the... So it's it's not quite as simple as a customer telling you what, what they would like to do. Their choice is whether to shop at your store or not. But you as a business have to, to follow all legislation from all different levels. Uh, Councillor Watson? Thank you. Just subsequent, and, and you hit the nail nail on the head. It, it is the protection of just not yourself. It's it is a, uh, your employees, or if you're holding a, a service club meeting or something, to protect everyone. And you know, we've had everything from the uh, president of France declaring that uh, if you're if you're not vaccinated, you're not riding the subway, you're not riding the trains, you're not riding the buses, you're not doing anything unless you do it. And we have other places, uh, like you say, the the colleges saying that. Unless you produce proof of vaccination, you're not coming into the school on a personal basis. So it, it really is all over the map. And and Craig said it that there's going to be legal challenges to that because someone's going to say, "Well, you're stomping on my rights," and um, you know I, I've got every right to be somewhere. And uh, that's going to be the proof, I guess. But we're going to have to go through that difficult process. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Did you have uh, your update to add? Yes, thank you, and, and good discussion. We had a similar discussion, as I said, at command team, and I can assure members of council and the public that as soon as we become aware of any guidelines or information that we can share, we'll share it with members of council and the broader community. It's just, it's ever evolving, and it's evolving day by day and week by week. And on that note, um, it wasn't too long ago that I was just before, um, Council advising that we're moving into stage two of the reopening plan and I'm before you this morning. Um, uh, following on the heels of our communications officer Mike Jennings saying we're moving into stage three so um, stage three. Uh, starts tomorrow five days earlier than originally planned due to do positive metrics uh, across all indicators, this is good news for residents and, and businesses in Wasaga beach. And our residents are to be commended on getting their shots. So we heard uh, the statistics provided by the deputy chief and we're certainly ahead in, in those areas. With the implementation of stage three, there are a few impacts on town operations. As members of council are aware, we've been preparing over the last few weeks with respect to stage two and then ultimately stage three. And uh, I just wanna outline some of the things that uh, we're planning in the, in the coming weeks. 
The arena will be opening on Monday, June 26th with, uh, with bookings. We expect the arena to be fully utilized. Staff will take the next week to get organized to make sure everything is ready based on health unit guidelines. Recplex halls, meeting rooms, youth center, senior adult learning center will be opening next week at 50% uh, capacity. The library will be opening once it is organized with the uh, with patrons uh, staying two meters apart. As members of council know, it is open now with about a 25% restriction. Um, they will be moving to the new uh, new regime once they're once they're organized. The YMCA will be opening on Tuesday, August 3rd with uh, very limited restrictions. The Y is currently delivering a day camp and an aquatics training program at their facility. My understanding is they're notifying their members uh, of their uh, the new reopening date and their plan, as I said, is to open on August 3rd. The Prime Time Club, Lions Club, 412 Club, Rotary Club and other clubs can now resume meeting indoors based on the limitations under the uh, regulations. A organized outdoor event limitation is now at 5,000 people or the space required to ensure that everyone is two meters apart. Our events team is reviewing the events listing for the latter part of the summer, including the memories of summer uh, fireworks in light of the, of the uh, lifting of some of the restrictions. Council and council committees uh, will be permitted to meet in person again with the public to a maximum capacity specified in the regulation. The clerk's office is reviewing the limitations and will be bringing a report to the command team and uh, coordinated committee in August on uh, next steps. Stage three is scheduled the last 21 days or until August 6th. Masking re remains a requirement in many situations. There is some talk about stage four, but it's unclear what that means or if in fact there will be a stage four. What is known is that as more people become fully vaccinated and other metrics con continued in a downward trend, there is a good possibility that most of the remaining restrictions will be lifted. But that'll be uh, subject to the, the province and, and their decision um, making regime. Madam Chair, that concludes my comments, and I'll be I'm pleased to take any questions that members of council may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for our CAO? Seeing none, I will read the motion that the Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee received the July 15th, 2021 verbal update from the CAO regarding COVID-19 for information. Could I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Kinney. Councillor Belanger, all in favor? And that passes unanimously, which would be six to zero. Uh, the next section of our meeting is closed session, but before we go in, I'm just going to uh, survey to see if there is a need by any member of council to go in camera to discuss the two items that are on the agenda. And seeing none, then we will not need to go into closed session. Um, would I just read the motions, uh, Madam Clerk? That's correct. Okay. So 8.1, that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee receives the update provided by the Director of Public Works in closed session pertaining to a legal matter for information. If I could get a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Kinney, Councillor Wells, all in favor? That carries six to zero uh, unanimously. And item 8.2, that the General Government Services Section of Coordinated Committee receives the update provided by the Director of Legislative Services and Clerk in closed session pertaining to legal advice for information. If I could get a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Watson and Councillor Kinney, all in favor? And that motion carries six to zero. And with that, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.